to you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, please uh, start sharing your screen and your talk. And I would invite you to give your talk on approach to ankle and ankle infringement. Thank you. Thank you, Maninder, and thank you, IFAS, for uh, the opportunity. Uh, so let's start the uh, without much of ado. I hope I'm visible. Am I visible? You are. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're fine. Thank you. So uh, my topic, uh, my job of today is an approach to the arthroscope of ankle, arthroscopy of the ankle, and I'll be also talking on the topic of the ankle impingement. So we have a few indications for ankle scopy. We have the soft tissue, broadly the soft tissue and the bony uh, causes for doing a scopy in ankle. And uh, soft tissue uh, causes would be synovitis, septic arthritis, uh, soft tissue impingements, syndesmotic impingement, that is the anterolateral impingement, and of course the brostrum repair with the scope. And of course, the bony would be osteochondral reason, uh, lesions, the arthritis leading to ankle fusions. We can use a dry scope or a little bit of scope with, uh, plan on, on, on articular pylon fractures. And of course, the ostrigon or when you do a posterior scopy. So there are various causes of why we do an arthroscopy of ankle. And the ankle arthroscope has evolved over a period of time. How do we do it? The position, let's start with the position. So if the ankle arthroscope, the initial days people used to put a distractor, then the soft tissue that is the non-invasive distractor came. In fact, now I have gone on to a absolute non-distraction, uh, but still, if you want distraction, then you can use your tibial uh, nailing support, the knee support, and then you can you have this type of the the the, uh, the distractor, the company made distractor, and this is how you do it, and um, you get a good amount of about 10 kgs of distraction in a non-invasive way, which is good enough to put a scope and do an intra-articular arthroscopy uh, of the ankle. With the presence, uh, if you don't have all this fancy stuff, you can do this with bandage. But I did uh, do this and then I felt I'm doing a lot of impingement, a lot of damage to the soft tissue by this create becomes a cord-like structure over a period of time as you do it. And so I've abandoned this particular part. So arthroscope of the ankle, you need a 2.4 or a 4 mm scope is good enough. But if you have a short barrel, then your lever arm of working is well and you don't, uh, you don't get tired and it is very easy to maneuver. All the things which you have used in the knee and hip, which the hip is long, the knee is the medium size, the ankle and the wrist where you have the short shavers, the short probes, the short, short length burst. So that is how we use for ankle and always use the gravity assisted water system. You don't want to put the pressure pump and have a huge amount of water um, into the soft tissue, going into the soft tissue. It's a small joint, you don't need much of a pressure. So 30 degree scope is good enough, you don't really need a 70 degree scope, but with the present coming up with a 1.9 nanoscope, which is coming in into, into work very fast, uh, then it becomes a very almost like an OPD procedure with a small needle type of scope. So to, at present, most often in, in India, when you're talking, we still can use the normal 4 mm scope. So how do we go about it? How do we have the anterior uh, scopy approach and the posterior scopy approach? Let's start with the anterior, the more commonly than anteriorly. Now here you need to have the anterior medial portal. Now we've got to palpate the tib and tibialis anterior and just a medial to tibialis anterior is your medial portal. And this is your first portal, the first place where you, and you put an incision and you uh, go into the joint. The second portal here is the anterolateral portal. Here you have to be careful about the risk of damaging the, uh, the peroneal nerve, the lateral peroneal of the lateral peroneal nerve. 
So you have to go in between the peroneal nerve and laterally to the peroneus tertius. So palpate your peroneus tertius and go just laterally. So here you have to make sure that you just put your small nick with your uh, 11 number blade and then open up with a small artery to go into the capsule of the artery, uh, ankle joint. And then you can see in the different parts wherein you can see the anteromedial side, you can see the deltoid, medial malleolus, medial gutter, and then in the, you can see the tibia fibula, the dome, and the lateral side, you can see the, the, the um, anterolateral and the anterior side, you can see the anterior gutter, and you have to look at the anterior impingement if you have. So now let us go forward to see what is anterior impingement syndrome. It is mostly occurs because of a chronic repetitive trauma leading to an impingement of anterior tibia against the talus. So it could be depending upon the position, the anteromedial, anterolateral, or strictly the anterior part. Usually the patient complains of ankle pain and terminal dorsiflexion, and you, on, on examination, you have an anterior ankle pain uh, which is kind of, you know, the patient will have some pain over the ankle area after exercise and relieve with, uh, uh, with the rest. On chronically, the patient gets pain uh, and then there is this restriction of movement because of the bony spurs that develops. The anterolateral soft tissue impingement is something which I would like to emphasize on. A lot of times this is missed, this is not identified, MRI does not identify if it is done, not done good. So the history of sprain and a pseudo instability may be there. It is not ATFL many a times, though the MRI might say ATFL. But then when you, when you have an eversion and a dorsiflexion, the pain, there's a classical impingement type of pain. Patient will wince with pain. And that is where you have to understand that is an anterolateral impingement. The a diagnostic would be give a small amount of local intersection and the patient is perfectly happy. There is no instability, mind you. There is no instability here. It is always the pain that is a problem here. And the anterolateral impingement, the soft, is a soft tissue impingement, it will be not picked up in an x-ray. An MRI, if you don't have an MSK specialist, they might just say it is an ATFL sprain. So that is something which I have found and I have done so much here in Kerala. We have this the Kathakali, the classical dancers, and they do have this anterior lateral impingement, which is often missed by so many people. So tenderness is accentuated here on dorsiflexion, and that is what you have to understand. The anteromedial impingement is mostly because of some loose bodies that is com uh, uh, coming in, and it is in that medial gutter, and the patient do come with some pain there and you've got to look at the loose bodies mostly because of the osteochondral defects. The osseous, the, the, as I said, it could be of bone or the soft tissue. Any weight bearing x-rays is helpful in understanding the osseous type of impingement. And you, you can see the exhaustosis between the, the, the anterior tibia and the, 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 the dorsal aspect of the talus. So this is you have to understand that when you're looking at this huge osteophytes, you've got to differentiate between the an anterior ankle impingement versus ankle osteoarthritis, because even osteoarthritis will have some amount of uh, osteophytes. And so just removing the impingement will not treat the cause. CT helps us to precisely lo locate the osseous type of abnormalities. MRI, as I said, is helpful in understanding the the soft tissue impingement. The, uh, the synovial thickening is better picked up with MRI. And of course, uh, and the, when you're looking at an OCD also, it is better picked up in an MRI. You can manage with conservative management, but then we are talking about arthroscopy. So let's do about, talk about arthroscope. So here you can see this, I put, this is my ankle scope. Uh, and you can see the amount of impingement that is happening. But when you, when you are doing it, you've got to rule out instability, other causes of problems. So do uh, a partial synovectomy, but make sure that you do not resect the capsule. And uh, so, so here, uh, this is the typical anterolateral side of the, here you can see the fibula. 
the lateral aspect of the tibia and the amount of synovium that is there. And here you can see the amount of the panis type of synovium. And the moment you remove all those type of synovium in that anterolateral area, and the patient is immediately relieved of pain, and you can easily dorsiflex. This is a, a scopy of, of, of one of the typically dancers, and uh, she had a remarkable relief of pain after this save, uh, this, uh, this clearing off. So this is another thing. Uh, this is another very, I thought I'll just put one weird case. This was an 11-year-old Indian. Uh, they, they, she's basically from Ireland, though they are Indians. And history of it, to a twisting injury two years back. And uh, she was managed conservatively, uh, but she continued to have this type of typical pain in certain moments of the ankle. X-rays is normal. And as, in, as you know, in the UK and Ireland, uh, the, the GP never refers because there was no positive finding here. All the basic findings were normal. Patient came to us after about two years of this pain. Very, when I saw this girl, very, very intelligent girl, very specifically, she would say that this is the type of pain, this is the time I have pain, but all the x-rays, everything was normal. The MRI, they got this MRI, I couldn't find anything. The radiologist also just suggested some ATFL, CFL injury, but when I, I, there was no history of instability, patient could walk, run, but no in history of instability. When I talked with the, my MSK radiologist, we are lucky to have a MSK radiologist, and they said, maybe some kind of chondral blotch I can see in the lateral side. And so somehow the patient's mother was very convinced about uh, when I said, our only thing we can do is surgery. So we went ahead and did a surgery on uh, the arthroscopy. Now you can see this before I go and start the video. This is a talus, this is the fibula, and this is the tibia. So you are looking at the anterolateral side of the ankle. And this is the, antero, the, the lateral gutter, which you are visualizing. Now I'm putting on the video. I put the lateral gutter, nothing. This is where normally we see the anterolateral impingement, a beautiful looking lateral gutter. And suddenly this type of bump comes in picture. I thought it was maybe something, just a plica type of thing. And then I went and went ahead in different angle and I saw a chondral bump actually here. And, uh, and if you look at the other side, there was a, a kind of, you know, uh, a, a kind of, uh, you know, the, uh, the a, a impact area. So I tried to move dorsiflex and plantar flex. And this is where exactly the, that chondral uh, was hitting her. And I just went at and uh, shaved that chondral uh, thickening uh, I don't know why it happened. The biopsy was just chondral thickening. We removed that thickening. And uh, it's been two years. I have been following up this girl. And now she's 13 year old, perfectly normal and very happy about this, uh, this thing. So this is something very strange, not seen in MRI, but very specifically on our anterolateral area. And before that, I, I did give her an injection, and that is when I was convinced myself of the surgery. So the anterolateral impingement is something which you should think and look proactively. Bony impingement is, of course, very easy. You, uh, you can see the uh, bone, and you can remove the exostosis depending upon the area, and make sure that uh, your tibia and talus do not come in contact with it. So you have to look at the bony impingement, remove it in toto, and make sure that the talus and tibia do not uh, come in contact. And that is when the advantage here, when you don't have a traction, the movements of the ankle is very easy when you don't have a traction. When you have a traction, you still can move, but it is, you, know, you really have to move with the weight, and it is still distracted. So when you don't have a traction, when you put a small scope, this is the advantage of here. And this is another uh, hist. Now this is coming to the osseous, uh, this thing. Again, as orthopedic surgeons, general orthopedic surgeons do not identify this. This was a 64 year old mother of a uh, husband in the ENT surgeon, son of an emergency uh, medicine doctor and has been having pain for two years. They were, uh, she has typically on climbing stairs and walking in uneven surface. Otherwise, walking in the kitchen, normal uh, household, 
no problem. Took a lot of treatment. She is very active. Took intraarticular steroids, but had no relief. But just a lateral view, and if you look at closely, you find why the problem here is. And your tenderness was purely in the anterior aspect of the ankle. And but then when they took the MRI, they also got the MRI done. The MRI was suggestive of ATFL and CFL, and the problem was more sorted out here in the in the tallow navicular area. I went back looking to the patient. There was absolutely no tenderness in the tallow navicular area. She never had any instability in the ankle, though the MRI. So don't uh, don't treat the MRI here in foot and ankle. It is an emphasis is made. Examine the patient. Treat to diagnose the patient clinically, and then look at the, uh, the, the, the problem. And here, if you see, uh, you can see the, little, the amount of chondral damage on that because of that bony impingement. And I have not used any distractor here, and I'm just shaving off all that, uh, uh, the tibial um, osteophyte, the anterior osteophyte, and that blotch of, cartilage which you see here, you can see that area is the Taylor problem and that was the cause of her pain, especially in the dorsiflexion when she's climbing the uh, stairs. And once you cleared this up and uh, uh, you get a very good um, uh, surface, smooth surface, make sure it's smooth and out. And this is how it is, the pre-op and the post-op and you find the osteophyte is gone and the patient is happy. There is no nothing done for the ATFL or CFL. There's nothing done in the talonavicular joint, though there is a small change in the talonavicular joint. Patient has been asymptomatic pre-op and post-op, but the ankle impingement is gone. So this is what I would emphasize again, clinical examination. So when you ask, you are removing the bone, how much bone should be removed in the anterior aspect? How do you have uh, look it up in in in, in, in chart uh, operatively. So the answer is one should always remove it as much as the level of the medial malleolus and the anterior level of the medial malleolus. So this is how you go intraoperatively assess how much to remove it. When what are the reasons of failure of um, problems is to fail uh, to failure of decompressing fully, and you should remove it from not remove it from inside out. You should not put your bar from inside and come out because you might leave some osteophyte out. So it is better you go from outside in and you can remove the complete osteophyte. And if it's a big one, then you can use an osteotome and always smoothen the edge before you say, okay, that's looking good. So routinely always try to confirm this. Even if you're an experienced guy, it is nice to confirm this with an image intensifier and uh, uh, then go ahead. As I said, if it is arthritic and you say this is impingement, then you have lost the, the, the bus. You, have, you cannot remove the impingement here and leave alone the ankle arthritis. The patient is never going to leave you. So Van Nick uh, de definitely um, had, uh, I mean, Nick Van Dyck had, uh, had uh, said this, degree of osteoarthritis is better prognostic factor for the outcome of arthroscopic surgery for an ankle than the size and location of the spur. So now uh, uh, talking about the anterior, now let's just go about the posterior part. So this is a 40 year old male who again a sports enthusiast. Sorry, I, 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 this was, a, uh, there was an X-ray behind that, I'm so, sorry. So uh, patient was known hyperuricemic and has been on adding, having a gouty at the attacks before, has been on febroxostats. But then uh, about six months, uh, since six months, he noticed that his movements have decreased. And you can see a huge amount of osteophytes, both anteriorly as well as posteriorly. And if you look at the, uh, the there you can see uh, the, the both anterior side and the posterior side, you can see a huge amount of bony impingement. So we've already seen the anterior scope, so I'm not going into the anterior scope, but I thought I'd just put the posterior scopy here, show the posterior scopy. So here you have already put the posterior scope, I've shaved off the thing, and now you can see, this is the talus, and uh, you can see the amount of, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, okay. So that is the huge amount of osteophyte that was posteriorly and the amount of scar tissue that is, uh, uh, and just lateral to that, I mean, medial to that is the FHL. And so the FHL marks the border in the posterior scope. So here it was quite a bit of osteophyte. So I did an osteotome and opened up and you can see some kind of, uh, this is how the, you can see some kind of silverish um, uh, finding over the talus showing the amount of impingement. So this was after the complete removal. And you can see after the anterior and posterior, we could get a good movement. And this is how the FHL, the tube light in the, in the, in the medial side, make sure that you don't go, go beyond that so that you don't in, in, injure the, uh, the neurovascular structure. And this is how the dorsiflexion we got immediately after the surgery. And so this is very aggressive movements you have to maintain after the surgery. So if you look at the literature, functional results were good to very good in 86% of the patients. And, um, and most of the results say very good results. So again, a review article here in 2017 saying that arthroscopic results were excellent and uh, is very effective uh, in, in such type of problems. So in conclusion, anterior ankle impingement is very common. You got to recognize it. Symptomatic chronic case can be managed successfully by arthroscopy and it is important to rule out instability and arthritis before you do an arthroscopic impingement removal. And you got to understand the associated condition and you got to address that properly. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Simon. That was a great presentation. I think I really enjoyed those cases that you showed. And, uh, you know, they were really interesting, the chondral bump lesion that you had, even the girl that you had the impingement lesion. And uh, I would just like to say that, you know, it was good that you were able to recognize these clinically because, as you said, on MRI, you can't recognize these. It's very difficult to recognize these lesions. So, as you said, it's more of a clinical decision whether to go in for surgery uh, rather than relying on the MRI, I think that was a really important point that you mentioned. Uh, we have uh, a question from Dr. Shantanu who's saying, uh, if you, uh, how often is it that your MRI findings are different from your clinical findings? Is that anything that? <laughs> I think, I think, uh, I think, as foot and ankle surgeons, uh, we all would have seen uh, that many a times our clinical findings are a little different than MRI. Maybe because uh, our radiologist, not many are MSK radiologist. And uh, in, in, in here, we had this MSK radiologist, but it is very difficult because in imaging, um, all this happens because of some kind of chronic injury. Impingement happens in chronic injury. And so there is some strain in ATFL and CFL. They, we always say that when you do a brostrum, you do it not because of MRI, you do it because of instability. It is not an MRI uh, diagnosis. It is for the instability. So if you don't have instability, and if it is pain, I always give a little bit of local anesthesia to confirm it. And if that is fine, then I believe on more of clinical uh, than uh, completely on MRI. MRI is helpful, adjuvant, but I don't solely believe on that. Okay, great. Thank you. I think we have lots of other questions, but I think we'll proceed with the next